Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. A couple things before we get into our show. First of all, if you've got any questions or comments on the show, email me, john at wordballoon.com. Follow me on Twitter, that's where I do most of my talking, at John Word Balloon. You can follow me also on Facebook, under my name, John Suntress, and also uh, the Word Balloon Network. Uh, tell a friend. I also am on Instagram, under Word Balloon. Uh, if you get this show... Uh, via podcasting platforms, please rate it or write a review if you don't mind. Um, you know, you can write me a bad review. You can you can give me bad stars, but uh, like me as well uh, as as uh, the opportunity presents itself. Also, I have a YouTube channel, Word Balloon. Uh, please go there and subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. I have over 500 uh, subscribers. I'm trying to get over a thousand. I'd like to add more video content. So uh, please consider doing all that to support Word Balloon. And now, back to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. More coverage from Terrificon. I got to tell you, I really enjoy doing that show. Uh, Mitch Halleck puts on a great program of guests, and I get to take advantage of his love of both modern comics and classic comics. Now, another episode that's dropping today is a great conversation with Donny Cates, we talk about his Marvel projects. We talk about his great book from Aftershock, Baby Teeth. But uh, this episode that you've downloaded is a great panel discussion of the Marvel black and white magazines of the 1970s. Now, much like Creepy and Eerie, and I make the comparison early in the discussion, uh, these were fantastic books. Uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, you had The Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, you had uh, uh, The Rampaging Hulk which was a great black and white Hulk. Of course, you had the Conans. Um, you had science fiction anthologies, adventure anthologies. And, um, you know, they were done in uh, black and white, sometimes grayscale. And uh, the top artists were doing it. And we have uh, two of the top great artists uh, on the show, as well as uh, a great writer and editor. Uh, three guys. They cover uh, all three of those uh, descriptions. Paul Galassi who did a lot of great work in Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, and of course, one of the key creatives behind Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. Uh, Shang-Chi was co-created by, of all people, Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin, because you always associate, at least I do, Doug Munch for the majority of the uh, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu and Master of Kung Fu uh, comic books. But uh, we've got Jim Starlin repping both the writer and the art side. Uh, his contributions to the Black and White magazines uh, came in Conan. And then Al Milgram, he of Marvel Fanfare fame, uh, also contributed to Conan uh, in the Marvel Black, White, Black and Whites. But these are guys from the Bronze Age and beyond. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, really all three of them might still be active. I'm not sure. I know Al was up until recently, unless he finally retired, was even working for Archie Comics during Archie the Married Life. So I actually got to find out, and I, I intend to uh, touch base with Al, get him to do a one-on-one -on -one as, as Starlin and, Mon and uh, excuse me, Galassi have done in the past. But I got all three of them together to talk about their contributions to Marvel Black and White magazines. Now, I should point this out because a uh, little E1 if you're scoring at home. Ernie Cologne had died that day. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that we all uh, mistook uh, Ernie for a Filipino creator as opposed to being a Puerto Rican creator. So in retrospect, very embarrassed by our error and, and I can only apologize and I know uh, I, 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 you know, in fact, I think at the very end of the conversation somebody does correct us. Uh, I hope so. But regardless, um, what we say about Ernie as a, as a creator is certainly heartfelt and uh, again, all I can say is apologies and embarrassment on uh, mistaking his nationality for Filipino as opposed to Puerto Rican. Uh, God, Ernie did such amazing work, and I want to expand on what we talk about by pointing out how versatile he was because he not only could do great adventure comic books, but he also did the 9-11 uh, Report, a graphic adaptation uh, which was a pretty amazing collaboration with Sid Jacobson, his longtime creator and friend, uh, also, uh, which is an incredible graphic novel. Uh, of course, he worked at Harvey Comics and uh, did uh, Richie Rich. He also worked on uh, Joe Palooka for Ham Fisher. There's my boxing connection with Ernie Cologne. 
Uh, unbelievable. I mean, and, and as he estimated back in 2007, being interviewed by the Comics Journal, uh, Ernie had figured he had drawn about 15,000 pages just for Harvey Comics. Pretty crazy, man. I mean, really, Ernie was just amazing. Uh, God, the New York Times obit has a wonderful cover that he did for Amethyst, Prince of Sev General. Uh, that's another thing that he did. He worked for everybody, man. I'm telling you, he did uh, great stuff for uh, Marvel. Um, he co-created Damage Control with the great Dwayne McDuffie. I can't speak enough of the amazing accomplishments of Ernie Colon, the great loss to the comics community. Uh, his fans are legion. I am among them. And uh, again, all I want to do is uh, tribute this great man who we lost uh, two weeks ago, uh, uh, the, the pre- two Fridays ago. So the great Ernie Colon is certainly reflected in this conversation again with Al Milgram, Paul Galassi, and Jim Starlin. We talk about Marvel black and white magazines of the 1970s on today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your great support via Patreon. Uh, can't do it without you, honestly. Uh, you know, Word Balloon, do my best to give you the best uh, conversations and interviews that I possibly can each day and week. More than a, you know, one or two episodes a week, usually. Um, I'm a little behind in that. I meant to release these episodes today on Friday. But uh, you understand, sometimes real, the real world gets in the way. But in the meantime, uh, I hope you enjoy what I try to do here at Word Balloon. And if you've got the, uh, the ability to help support Word Balloon, really appreciate it. Is Word Balloon worth the price of a comic book uh, with you a month? Is it worth a dollar a month to you? If it is... Uh, I hope you'll consider subscribing to Word Balloon. You can do that by going to wordballoon.com. Uh, check out what we've got for you there on the Patreon uh, page. Uh, if you go to the uh, wordballoon.com page, you'll see my ad for Patreon. Click on that. That'll get you to my Patreon page. Or if you want to go directly, you go to patreon.com slash wordballoon. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. And this episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Uh, today is a special day for Aftershock because... We have Donny Cates on to talk about his wonderful book, Baby Teeth. That's among the Aftershock classics that have really made a mark in today's comic world. That includes A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and Brothers Dracool. Also things like Dark Red from my buddy Tim Seeley, Stronghold from my buddy Phil Hester. Cullen Bunn has a new book out, Knight's Temporal, Joe Pruitt's horror anthology, Shock. Chris Sabella's Truff Fall just got started last month and is already in Chapter 2. And then, of course, there's uh, Matthew Clickstein's You Are Obsolete. Great books. They cut across all genres to take us readers far beyond our comfort zones. Now, I've got Donny Cates for you also today on another episode of Word Balloon. And in the weeks ahead, we'll have more talks with Aftershock creators about their books. But you don't have to wait. You can find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. As a Lucky Strike Extra, as they used to say on Old Time Radio, that was on Your Hit Parade. It was sponsored by uh, Lucky Strike Cigarettes. And the, Your Hit Parade was like kind of the top 40 of its day, or the top 10, really. Because um, I think it was only an hour or a half hour show. But uh, sometimes they would play a song and they call it a Lucky Strike Extra. And uh, in this uh, capacity, I wanted to present to you a nice testimonial from Word Balloon that I got from uh, a film director, editor, performer, producer... Uh, he's the producer of Cody, Kobe, uh, Cody Banks, and uh, the first one, the, the best one, and also, uh, you know, directed one of my favorite geek movies, Free Enterprise, that you can watch on Amazon Prime, and uh, you know him as one of the great Trexperts out there. He is a, a vast font of knowledge when it comes to Star Trek and all things pop culture. Robert Meyer Burnett, he's one of my favorite guests on War Balloon. Well, he he has a YouTube channel that he just started at the end of 2018, and he just reached his 200th show. Uh, this happened on Sunday, and uh, it was very nice. And I uh, I sent him a little super chat, wanted to show my support for what Rob does because I enjoy his product. I love his opinions, man. I'm so glad that he is uh, speaking about uh, the pop culture news of the day and doing it very well. His uh, program is called Rob Servations. Uh, you should go there and uh, check it out. He does it. Almost uh, seven days a week. He comes pretty close. I mean, uh, you know, he even had uh, an episode this past Saturday and Sunday, and I'm sure he'll be on on Monday afternoon uh, continuing the trend unless uh, real-life work gets in the way because he is an active film editor and producer as well. In fact, he keeps uh, hinting about some new project that he's got streaming, uh, so it'll be interesting to hear what that is when he's able to talk about it. 
But I asked him a question about uh, one of uh, my favorite shows out there right now, The Orville. And, you know, Orville, as, a, as it's always pegged, is a Star Trek homage. You could say it's the best Star Trek show Gene Roddenberry never had his hands on, or even Rick Berman, or the other television people, even Alex Kurtzman now, the current keeper of Star Trek. Well, pretty ironic, but if you, I'm sure you know that when D- Discovery started, Seth MacFarlane did his tribute show, The Orville, and uh, got people like Brandon Braga and a lot of other former Star Trek uh, special effects people and producers and writers uh, to be on the staff of The Orville. And what started off as a real parody show, I think has really found its footing. So, uh, but uh, you, I want you to hear Rob's opinion, and also he gives me a nice testimonial about Word Balloons. So uh, if you'll indulge my uh, ego for the stroke I get from one of my favorite uh, pop culture pundits out there, uh, here's Rob uh, Burnett about what he thinks on the Orville to start things off on today's Word Balloon. John Suntress is here from the Word Balloon podcast. Now, John, uh, another person I've never met in person, uh, but I've talked to him a lot via his podcast. I've been on his podcast a number of times. If you haven't listened to the Word Balloon podcast, you've got to listen to the Word Balloon podcast. John's out of Chicago, uh, especially if you're a comic book fan. But his podcasts are long, deep dives into many different subjects. He has people from across the spectrum. And I, I don't mean the, like spectrum in terms of behavior. I mean, in terms of, well, I guess in terms of behavior, too. I'll just say across the spectrum, because why not? It's not a problem being on anybody's spectrum, no matter what that spectrum is. But he's got a lot of really talented, insightful people that he's interviewed. He's a really good interviewer, and it's a lot of fun to be on a show. John is here. John says, congrats. Do you like the Orville? Are you excited for Hulu? Uh, John is asking about Seth MacFarlane's The Orville. You know, I, I like the Orville. I don't love the Orville. I like the cast. I like the characters. I like the show itself. I enjoy watching it. But my only real complaint with the Orville, and I'm sure it's going to start to change now that it is on Hulu, is I feel that it it needs a little bit more of its own identity. It seems to me like even the the big two-parter and the the timeline stories, they are doing Star Trek still. And I'd like to see them do, it's been a Star Trek homage. I'd like to see the Orville have more of its own identity and sort of move away from Star Trek type of stories and find out what kind of stories that are uniquely Orville stories. Um, But I like the Orville and I think when they go to Hulu, it will free them up, like Seth MacFarlane has talked about. They're not necessarily locked into a running time. If they want to do an hour-long episode, they don't have to worry about uh, that. They can put on commercial breaks, but they're not they're not limited by network programming standards. So I think that's going to be great. And I think they can be edgier. It's going to be really interesting. It was like watching Veronica Mars. By the way, I love the new season of Veronica Mars on Hulu. I hope they renew that show. But but it was interesting seeing more sexuality and hearing more bad language on Veronica Mars. I was like, oh, Interesting. We're on cable. We're on streaming now. But yes, yeah, so I'm a big fan of the Orville. I'd like to see it continue. So there you go. Rob Meyer Burnett's thoughts on the Orville uh, as not a rebuttal, but just uh, my own counterpoint to what Rob says. I, I understand what he's saying. And I and I, I know a lot of Star Trek fans likely feel that way. I know Franco feels that way of Art Balthazar and Franco. Tiny Titans fame and all oh yeah, comics fame. Uh, he is not a fan of the Orville the way I am. I think he's slowly warming up. And I would point to the way they amped the show up in the second half of the second season. I thought they had a lot of creative uh, episodes. Um, the big budget uh, two-part episode where Isaac, the androids, uh, people kind of turn on, um, and I'm forgetting their, their uh, Federation uh, name, the Union, I suppose. I think it's The Union. And uh, I thought that was incredibly spectacular. Great special effects. The second-to-last two-part arc. And then the time arc that even uh, Rob mentions as well, where I think Adrian Pilecki really gave a Tour de Force performance as both her younger self and uh, an alternate future self. Um, those were great. And my only comment would be everything that Rob wants to happen, I think, uh, with time and reflection, he'll. Re- I believe that he'll look back on the second season and see that's really where the Orville started stepping away from just being 
uh, a Trek parody or, you know, yeah, you know, I guess you could say parody in lowercase letters because I honestly think it is an homage more than a parody. And uh, the tropes of Star Trek, you know, even Stargate would do Star Trek like episodes. So you, you got a crew, you got a ship, you know, you've got different interesting alien characters working together. Um, I, man, I love Scott Grimes. I think he's great. I loved his episode with uh, Leanne Meester, I believe is how you say her name. I, and uh, it was uh, reconstructing a woman uh, in a virtual reality setting from her iPhone. I thought that was really clever. And it wasn't something... I guess they've done it kind of in Star Trek before. But I really thought even more tangible using an iPhone as an example versus something on the holodeck back in the next generation days or deep space nine or what have you. Um, you know, but I, I really do. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Scott Grimes fan ever since mystery Alaska. I think he is such, I know he was a kid actor as well, but, uh, I really like his work, uh, ever since mystery Alaska. And I, I really think he's a great foil for, um, Seth MacFarlane. And by the way, Seth MacFarlane, fantastic. I mean, honestly, I love him as the captain. Um, he's really acting. And, and you know, sometimes he his reach uh, exceeds his grasp, and that's okay. I mean, I appreciate that he's trying. I think he's only getting to be a much better actor. In fact, I love him on that Roger Ailes uh, Showtime show with, um, oh, God, now I'm blanking, Cinderella Man. R- Russell Crowe has Roger Ailes. And, man, Seth was terrific on that. Um, and I think he's great when he's in serious dramatic roles. And I do think the Orville has succeeded in its dramatic uh, moments. Uh, I loved the story about um, the unisex uh, alien uh, that's kind of the wharf of the show. Uh, first, I loved uh, him and his mate getting addicted to smoking. I thought that was fantastic. Even back in the first season when they had a child and they had to decide, you know, t- to let the child be raised in its uh, unisex environment. They, like, kind of would, uh, you know, um, fix women to be male characters, which I think was an incredibly uh, uh, ambitious way to look at uh, the questions of gender on a science fiction show. I mean, that was very uniquely Orville. So um, I think they're already doing what Rob wants the Orville to do. And as Rob said as well, I think Hulu will only open up more doors like that. And also, much like the better Star Trek shows, they know it's not just about whatever the problem at hand is. It's learning more about the crew. And I do think that Scott Grimes is his own character. Adrian Pilecki is her own character. Beverly Johnson as the doctor, Star Trek veteran herself. Um, everybody, I think, brings a very unique perspective. I think they have interesting aliens. I love Norm MacDonald's slime character. Um, it's great. I really, really like it. And, I, and I'm so glad that the Orville is getting the opportunity to continue on Hulu. Uh, I'm going to be watching. And I think uh, it will at, le- at least get at least two seasons out of the deal. I hope more because it's such a tremendous show. I mean, thank God for streaming where we've uh, been allowed to see more of Veronica Mars, as Rob mentions, and uh, Arrested Development and Longmire and Community and all these other shows that have benefited from an extra season or two because of streaming. Um, That's great, and I know that us diehard fans, The Expanse, obviously, going into season four. Unbelievable stuff. Will the same fate happen to Krypton? Will DC Universe save Krypton? That's going to be an interesting question. I hope Krypton gets a chance... To finish its story. I, I And I think they certainly could with just a two-hour movie. I've loved the progression of Adam Strange. Adding Lobo was a lot of fun this year. Fleshing out Brainiac has been a lot of fun this year. And being an old 70s World of Krypton fan from the comic books, uh, I appreciate the environment that they've set up on this show. And I do think that even if this is it and we only get two seasons, hats off to the production crew and cast for a great show that is a nice part of the Superman mythos. I like Krypton a lot better than Gotham. I'm shrugging. I apologize. By the way, I took advantage of the uh, free week of epics and uh, caught a couple episodes of Pennyworth, and I'm glad I did. I think it's excellent. I will be purchasing uh, maybe the DVD when it comes out. Um, I Man, there's so many options these days that to take on another uh, streaming channel, I really have to think about it. And there's a lot of epic shows that uh, have my interest. Berlin Station sounds like a great espionage show, and I've heard nothing but good things about that. 
Uh, they have great comedy specials. They dabbled in boxing. I don't think they're doing it anymore. They produced William Shatner's amazing documentary, Chaos on the Bridge, and they've done other great Star Trek programming as well. The Captain's TV series, I believe, was an epic series. But uh, I was really impressed with Pennyworth. And again, man, I, I appreciate what they tried to do with Gotham, but I just could not get into it. But uh, really, uh, as I said, as opposed to that, enjoyed Krypton and really uh, have enjoyed Pennyworth in these couple uh, first episodes. It's a great 60s uh, kind of spy, hitman sort of agenda that I really think I've, I've enjoyed and makes Thomas Wayne almost as mysterious as Bruce Wayne. Pretty neat stuff. And then I love the guy who's playing Alfred. It's uh, very interesting to see young Alfred. In the same way, it's interesting to see uh, young Inspector uh, Morse on, uh, on PBS. And now I'm blanking on, on that show, of course. Endeavor. Uh, yes, Endeavor. So anyway, uh, enough uh, blathering. Let me get back to uh, our main topic today, which was uh, black and white Marvel magazines of the 1970s. This is from Terrificon just two weeks weekends ago. And uh, it's a great conversation. Paul Galassi, Jim Starlin, and a few minutes into the uh, uh, conversation, Al Milgram joins us to talk about this very interesting time at Marvel and also some uh, thoughts on Ernie Colon. Again, apologies. We, we kind of thought he was uh, Filipino and not uh, Puerto Rican, and we made that great mistake. So I do apologize uh, for those people who are like, hey, that's not cool. Believe me, we know we fucked up, so we're sorry about that. But otherwise, a great conversation and even nice tributes about Ernie as well. Coming to you now on Word Balloon. Just lean forward. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you guys, yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. Just like Paul and uh, George during uh, Help when they're singing, you're going to lose that girl. Okay. With their yeah. sharing the microphone. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that was me. Sinatra singer. So. Yeah. <laughs> you're Sam. You're in my way. That's hilarious. I have a Sans t shirt that has the marquee, that has the Rat Pack marquee. It's one of those knockoffs. Should we give uh, Carl and Al hopefully just a couple more minutes, guys, and then we'll start? If that's cool. I hope you have questions ready because uh, the guys are ready to uh, ask, answer some uh, questions regarding, regarding a, a very cool subject. I'm glad you guys all came. We have very little to say on our own, so we're just hanging out. <laughs> kill the afternoon. Yeah. Oh, no. Kill the hour. Yeah, give me like two more minutes and then we'll start. How's the show, guys? Yeah, how is it so far? Cool. Excellent. Always one of my favorite shows because it's so comic book centric. Which is a rare thing. doesn't look too happy over there. You run into a wall or something? <laughs> He's paying no attention. <laughs> Ignore me. Go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Until you get a better joke. <laughs> I never do that costume show. I just commenting drawing Spider Man. It's difficult. I started off with Spider Man. Quite literally, I was working, doing up layouts for John so he could get ahead on uh, his deadlines. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you know, I walked in the door and they said, help John. Quite literally. And then they made me the art director. Now, where were you living at that time? I just moved to New York. I was okay. living on Staten Island for the first few days, and then I moved into Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was an interesting time. Yeah, it's quite fun. Yeah. All right, we may as well start, and uh, if, you know, hopefully Carl and Al will join us. But if not, we've got two great guys that represent yeah, a very wake cool, up, wake up. <laughs> a very cool period in Marvel, the '70s, the black and white magazines. I'm glad you came today. My name's John Suntress. I host a podcast called Word Balloon. Oh, thank you. Mitch is always very kind and lets me do incredible panels, and, and this one is no exception. Uh, very happy to welcome to the uh, podium here, or whatever this day is. Uh, first, um, you know him from his wonderful work on Shang Chi, uh, great work on Batman, another company, but you know, very cool stuff. Oh, Holy see everybody. <laughs> and a father of Thanos, and uh, uh, Dark, Dark, Dark Star, Dark Star, Dark Star. Uh, Dreadstar. Dreadstar. Uh, sorry about that. Man. There you go. And a hell of a lot more. <clears throat> Jim Starlin, everybody. <laughs> so, guys, I know in the case of Paul, I'm assuming you obviously did work on Deadly Hands and Kung Fu, correct? Correct. Very cool. Um, which was different than the uh, what was? Which was the black and white? Which was the monthly? The the color monthly. The the, the monthly was the master of color. Yeah. Yes. That's right, and Deadly Hands was the other one, okay. On the magazine racks. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. And you actually started off on the Deadly Hands, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you? That was that was before you went on that show. Okay. Excellent, man. That's cool. Yeah. This other half was doing the drawing on it before that. There you go. And Jim, forgive me. What what black and whites did you work on? Uh, I worked on a Conan story, and I think I did one fill-in issue after you started doing Master of. I did a fill-in thing on Deadly Hands. Cool. Oh, that's great, man. So our, our black and white history is minimum, but we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, you know, again, I mean, got so many great magazines. I think eleven in total, and I, and I think coming in at MC. You know, if, if I may, because uh, I, unfortunate ironic timing. Uh, we lost a great artist who also contributed to the Barbell Black and White magazine today, and that's uh, Ernie Colon, or yeah. Colon, you know. Yeah. So, guys, have any memories of working with Ernie? Or just even as a peer? Yeah, Ernie worked with uh, Peter David on uh, a different uh, version of Dreadstar for Malibu, and wow. I just thought his work was beautiful, and uh, I couldn't wait to see what he was going to do with the character, and he uh, did a dazzling job. He will be missed. How about Paul? Any thoughts? No, I, I can echo what Jim laid out pretty yeah. much. Pretty much. Excellent. And forgive me, is this Carl or is this uh, Al? Al Milgram. Al, pleasure to meet you, man. Hey, how you Thank, doing? Thanks a lot. Man. Thanks yeah, for coming. Minimum, uh, microphone, so you have to Yeah, we'll share. <laughs> what if I shout? <laughs> You know him as the, as the uh, editor and host, as I used to think of him, as uh, the Marvel fanfare, oh. for, uh, among other great works as well. Al Milgram, everybody. Hi. Sorry I'm late. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, my pleasure. So, so what were your black and white uh, black and white work back in the day? Um, that's a good question. I was wondering why I was even on this panel. Uh, Just like us, we can I mean, I worked with uh, I worked with Jim on uh, we, we were doing the Master of Kung Fu and a, co and a Conan. We did what one, one Conan, Conan story? That counts. Master of Kung Fu. Right. That was it. Yeah, that, that was, was it. it. That's, our, that's our black and white. <laughs> okay, thank you. Question. Uh, good afternoon. All right, there we go. Let's go. No, and also, Al, uh, <laughs> any any Ernie Cologne memories? We unfortunately lost Ernie today. I don't know if you're. Oh no, I hadn't heard. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. To hear Eighty-eight. That. Yeah. Uh, well, no. I mean, uh, the the main thing I'll say about Ernie and and <clears throat> all the Filipinos is that uh, they terrified me because they were so damn good. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of the people in the industry, I, I remember, uh, oh, my phone's buzzing. Uh, Jim and I came to the DC offices together to show our portfolios. Do you remember this? Right. It was probably 71. It was like right before we got work. Yes. Does that sound about right? Sound about right, yes. And so we're showing stuff to Joe Orlando, and Joe is a sadistic bastard. <laughs> and he's going, <laughs> Yeah, you guys got some talent. He says, but look at this. And he pulls out like some Tony DeZuniga uh, stuff on, on uh, uh, sure. Jonah Hex. And he goes, isn't this great? And then he starts cackling. He starts going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm going like, well, yeah, you know, that's, he says, they got a whole army of guys there who can draw like this. <laughs> so I'm going like, well, I almost got into the comics industry. What a, you know, what a shame that I, you know, and, and, and we figured they're living in the Philippines. They're probably working for like $5 a page. We, I don't know. I know they, they yeah. had... They didn't get American rates. They didn't get American rates. No. Yeah. So what, you know, a corporation, you say, hey, these guys are really good and they'll work for like a fifth of the price. They'll go sign those guys up. Uh, so we were a little bit concerned, but the one saving grace is that I think the American artists, by and large, uh, were, were much more dynamic in their storytelling and, uh, and maybe just better storytellers. The Filipino guys were incredible draftsmen. They could all ink. I think they started them inking when they were like six. They probably, you know, had apprentices starting. Uh, this, this kid holds a crayon really well. Give him a brush. Here's some <laughs> ink. Here's what we'll do. Some sweatshop. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know. They were yeah. geared toward very illustrative one-shot drawings, you know, and so the, the continuity thing sort of got away from them. Yeah. And that, that's why some of us guys still got work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. These guys, uh, well, and we were, it was a period of expansion, so there was a lot of work to go around. I mean, they also, and again, Ernie, uh, inking the uh, the Conan stuff over John Buscema, he could do incredibly uh, you know detailed and intricate stuff that was great for the black and white magazines. The color comics, 
You could do more intricate stuff, but sometimes it sort of fought with the color a little bit if you had too much detail and too much picky textures and on the terrible newsprint we were using at the time and you know with the mediocre reproduction and stuff like that uh, so in that respect and then you know they could do wash work they were very adept at, at uh, technically you know doing technical illustration so in that way they were you know they were godsend for the black and white magazines and uh, there was, you know, that was a whole new extra market Marvel had added, uh, you know, to their roster. DC never did it, did they? Not that I recall, no. Yeah, uh, the black and white magazine, I, got, I sort of have a perspective on the black and white magazines over at Marvel that nobody else does because I came in a little bit earlier than both of you guys. When Marvel still had these men's adventure magazines, and these were oh. uh, pseudo. Uh, Men's, you know, there was pinups in them, and oh, they yeah. would have these stories of great white hunters and guys who'd done, you know, across the Pacific. And, uh, well, and didn't they always have Nazis and, and yep. women, Nazis. women in their underwear tied to stakes? Yes. All, I don't yes. know. The Nazis were really busy after the war. I don't know. <laughs> and these but they were like pulp magazines. Yeah, absolutely. So these books were just about to go out of business as I came into the uh, came into working at Marvel, and basically. Uh, most of the stuff that they put in these things was bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, this woman who worked up there, who I dated for a while, uh, Mary McFerrin, oh. she used to write all the letters in the back of the columns. Oh, that's hilarious. Nobody did that, and she was responsible for finding people to have their picture taken so that they would be the <laughs> author, author of this adventure story. And so I ended up being some guy who had been involved in... Uh, uh, Spanish-American War or something. Well, I mean, I, look, I was like 20 years old. There was no way this was going to work. But they took a picture of me. It was an old picture. Yeah, it was an old picture. I was like 12. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, you know, my one contribution before I ever got into Marvel Comics was to be this guy named Sebastian something or other in the back of one of these things. And because of these things, they still had these contracts. Uh, they were looking for something. Saul Brodsky had a relationship with the printer, right. and he was the production Tell manager. Yeah. yeah, he was the production manager up there, and mm -hmm. so he, uh, as much as Roy and everybody else, sort of pushed to get the black and white books coming around so that <coughs> they could still keep this place in business. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so it was a little one hand washes the other kind of thing. Yeah. So it had nothing to do with what Jim Warren was doing with his publications? And I think it probably had a major factor in it, but it was also the fact that they had this relationship with the printer and they could go back there and they had just dropped the, they were doing like three or four of these a month. And so this was the replacement work. Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird because as I had read, and I don't know if this is true or not, Martin Goodman didn't want uh, comics that weren't all ages because obviously you were able to take liberties with these black and white magazines and be a little more violent, be a little more sexual. Um, I remember all that stuff, and it was shot like as a kid. I was like, oh, look at this. Huh. Uh, there, there's an interesting surprise. But... Um, when, once Cadence took over in Curtis, as I understand it, that's what kind of opened the door to, to doing these black and white magazines. That may be true. Uh, the whole time I was uh, up at Marvel to begin with, I never met Martin Goodman. Okay. Uh, he had little to do with the company. He was sure. mostly Stan running things out of his office in the back. Okay. I actually met him. <clears throat> he, I was related to him. For real? That's what I'm told. <laughs> My grandparents... Last name was Goodman. Okay. And they used to tell me that living in Michigan, they said, Oh, yeah, we got a cousin who owns a comic publishing company in New York. I said, Oh, great. And they once gave me a Patsy and Hetty comic to look at. And I went, Ugh, you know. Um, and, you know, at the time, Marvel was still doing the, uh, the monster books mostly, so I had no interest in them. I was strictly a superhero guy. Okay. Um, but I once wrote him and I said, you know, my grandparents are so-and-so. Uh, they say we're related. I'm a big Marvel fan. We're coming to New York on a visit. Can I come by the office? let me, this has nothing to do with black and white magazines, by the way. Uh, he says, but, yeah, I said, could I, and he, and he wrote me back. He said, we might be related. Come by the office. And so he was, you know, he was keeping a good, you know, arm's length. But he let me come by. We chatted for a little bit. And I remember because... 
it, it was just at the time when Steve Ditko left Marvel, and I was devastated. And I said, why did Steve, Di-? you know, and he goes, oh, they're all crazy, these artists. And I'm sitting there going, well, I want to be an artist, you know. But And then uh, there was some deal where I think uh, at the, around the same time, Mike Sikowski, who was a longtime pro and did a ton of work for DC, uh, he had come over to Marvel to test the waters. Okay. And then he ran right back to DC with whatever they offered him, and said, "Can you can you beat this deal?" And they gave him. That's when he started uh, editing Wonder Woman. Maybe was he writing it too? I know he was drawing it. Yeah. So, you know, there was a lot of that kind of back and forth thing where there was finally somebody who who was on a competitive level with DC, and um, you know, so suddenly people were you know, saying, wait, this is not the only game in town. And they'd come over to Marvel and they'd work for Marvel. And, and, and the only black and white books I remember at DC was when Kirby came over there. Oh, right. And he did, uh, you know, um, uh, the, in the days of the mob. Yep. And he did a couple that were never published. One was a black romance magazine. And not, it was, you know, black people. It was, you know, yeah. African-American people having romances. Who'd have thought it? And uh, Novel for 1970. Well, it was. At the yeah. time, it yeah. was probably, you know, groundbreaking. Sure. But uh, And uh, what was it? His Strange Echoes of the Spirit World was, I think, yeah. ran one issue. Yep, yep. Uh, so, you know, Kirby was always trying to stretch things, and he probably saw... Mar- when was Marvel doing the black and white books? Started in like seventy three. Yeah. Was yeah. my research. So that was that was you know right around the same period I think. So okay. Um, but yeah, I didn't. It never occurred to me that Marvel had some other black and white before the, things that they were doing that they probably just did it to keep the printer busy as much as anything. Yeah, Paul. You know, when when did you join Marvel and what and was so Deadly Hands was your first uh, gig at Marvel? Uh, <clears throat> Master of Kung Fu. Or, or you know. Well, he told me that it was Deadly Hands first before Master. I think Master. Mobius, the living vampire. Oh, very cool. Was, <laughs> was that your first? I yeah. think it was, uh, yeah, I think so. Because yeah. I, I think a couple of your very earliest uh, Shang-Chi stories. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I thought I thought it was maybe the first thing you did. Pardon me, I didn't eat lunch, and I, you can eat I'm the diabetic, pie. so I'm, right, I'm eating in front. I didn't bring enough for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> was... Um, were, were you guys allowed, were you told up front, hey, you know, we're not under the comics code, so therefore, you know, you guys can be a little more violent, be a little more sexual, things like that? No, no, I don't recall. No. I have to go to Creepy and Eerie and Warren. Yeah. And get away with that stuff. Okay, okay. Well, you know, there was like Devilina, I know, we used to show some, and Daughters of the Dragon, I remember, showed a little action, you know, as far as sexuality beyond the violence and everything. Yeah, a little action, huh? Well, I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah, we knew. I, the story I did, the first one was with uh, Conan with Roy Thomas. He was a writer, and so we, uh, he was very upfront that we could do something more. And uh, <clears throat> so I threw in this sex scene with uh, Conan and some woman and a horse nearby, and there was a sword. And uh, Roy, uh, so, uh, and Roy, Roy found the whole thing rather embarrassing. <laughs> And looking back at it, so do I, actually. <laughs> that's coming from the restroom. Subtle. Yeah, yeah, it was real subtle. <laughs> well, that's like Storenko did that S.H.I.E.L.D. page where yeah. it's Nick Fury and it's the, what was the, uh, the Countess, or yep. what was she? And Val. And, there, yeah, Val. Val and, Countess Val and there's a, you know, there's a pistol in a holster, and I remember, you know. Phone off the hook. Yeah, the phone's, phone's off right. the hook. Yeah. And they, they got a zebra skin rug, I, I, you know. It's just, it's swanky pad. They're playing, they're playing part cheese. And didn't yeah, sure. Like right. Tommy's code, make him put the phone back on the hook. Yeah. Yep. Did they really? Yeah, and I forget what the gun because the gun wasn't the original panel, and they and he that was his substitution. That's and they're cool. like great, and not realizing the implication. Yeah, and then there was a train going through a tunnel. There. Exactly. <laughs> North by Northwest. Nice. Very Nick, nice. when did you put in this train track in your apartment? <laughs> well, you know, we got a new Hefner and a Cole. Well, I, well the that's such awesome. was so fun because we used to have to do these double these pages to repeat. Um, there was a thing Marvel was doing, so they give one free page. Oh, and uh, they turn them sideways. Yes, and uh, what I did was cheap Xerox, bastards. Yeah, I xeroxed the thing in the first issue of War, uh, Warlock, and then put it in the second issue. And the first issue had a bunch of bare bottom little demons attacking, and then the comics code made us put. Uh, Little trunks, trunks on them in the second issue. They had missed the first one entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Al mentioned. Fool us once, 
<laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> Obviously, and you mentioned that the crude uh, production and also the paper made color things look you know, not as great. But the black and whites obviously didn't have that problem. And Paul, I don't know, like, uh, you know, comparing your Mobius stuff to what you were doing in Deadly Hands, like, did you see, oh, wow, the art obviously gets, you know, reproduced much better in, yeah. the, in the black and white magazines Definitely. and stuff. Yeah. So well, the books were a little bit bigger, too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah they, well, they were magazine size, certainly. Detail. Sure. Yeah. But even, like, the grayscales and whatever, whatever you know, you guys did as far as art, I, I don't know if there was much of a difference or if that happened after you guys in production in terms of like I said, the grayscale or whatever, as opposed well, wait, to wait, when you say grayscale, uh, yeah. If I'm doing what are we talking color, about? You tell me. Well, I'm, I'm talking about whatever the finished product was on the black and white pages. That while they weren't colored, they had you know different tones of black oh, and gray. Well, there were different ways of doing that. I remember the 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 one job, the one kung fu job we did. I I used Zipatone and. Okay. That's real time consuming. Tell them what that is. Zipatone, uh, in the, in, back in the day, before computers even existed, they would get, there'd be these sheets of dot patterns, well, any different patterns, mostly we use dots, but there were line patterns and crosshatch patterns and any texture you could think of, and it was on these um, transparent sheets of, let's say, plastic. Uh, acetate. Was it acetate? With, with a sticky backing, but it was really thinner than acetate. Well, whatever. And what you do is you, t- you take a sheet of Zipatone, and it had a backing that you could peel it off of, and you could put it down on the page, and then using an X-Acto blade, you could cut out the, uh, you know, whatever you were shading, either a wall or if it was, yeah. uh, you know, Tom Palmer was the best at using it of anybody I ever saw. He could use it to, uh, you know, put tone on the side of a face or a figure or whatever, and you could get different effects. There were dark to light effects, which gave it a nice, yeah. you know, sundown, and it's getting darker, you put a color on that, and, yeah, produced, you know, you didn't get, it would look like a gradiated color. It's produced as line, like a, like using a black pen or... Yeah, well, they, that's right. So you did, they were black dots or, or patterns, but because we could only reproduce a black line, but then on the, on the printed artwork, it looked gray because it was, it was a pattern. You know, it was like a, a sheet of 50% or 20% gray. Wally Wood used to use it to great effect all, also all the Tell time. Tell who Wally Wood is. No. Why not? Who doesn't know who Wally Wood is? Show of hands. Okay, he was wow. he was one of the all time greatest comic book artists. Did brilliant work. Worked for EC Comics back in the fifties. Um, work in the first Mad magazines. Yes, Mad magazines. Did work for Marvel. Did work all over the place. Did the very famous Walt Disney uh, porno version of all the Walt Disney characters, <laughs> where they're all having all kinds of perverted sex together. Oh, take it. You want to Disney's still looking for Wall, uh, Wally Wood, but uh, <laughs> but he's he's passed away, yeah, so they, they're not going to find him now. The Wham-O? Wham-O? was that the big yeah. giant one? Yes, he did a job or two in there. Yeah, there was some guy in a red suit. I remember, but he did. I mean, he worked for a lot of companies over many many years and did just beautiful work. He did some of the you know the the drawings for these like little trading cards back in the day. Mm-hmm. And, I don't remember which ones offhand, but he did. He yeah. just a great, great illustrator, artist. People of our generation, he was one of those gods you admire. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Thunder Agents. If you guys know Thunder Agents, for Tower Comics, he created yeah. the the Thunder Agents for Tower Comics, which was, I think, when he got fed up working at Marvel, he went over there and said, "Let's let's do our own." And it was really some interesting stuff. It could have been a contender, but. It, it didn't last that long, unfortunately. Usually in those cases, it was distribution that I think like hurt those other publishers, am I right? In terms of, I mean, because, you know, obviously Ditko did the same thing going to Charlton. Yeah, and, you the know, distribution well, comics discussed. in the early days were just to fill up the back of the truck for the Life magazines and Time magazines, and if you didn't get in on that first load, you just didn't get around. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, growing up in Chicago, uh, I, we always saw the black and whites as they were coming out. And I was wondering, as far as stories go, um, were you guys allowed to use Marvel Universe characters in these non-code uh, books? Or was it strictly the Dracula book had to be just the Dracula stuff uh, for, for Kung Fu? It was just the Shang-Chi guys and Daughters of the Dragons. Well, they did a, uh, they did a black and white Spider-Man book, Spectacular Spider-Man. But it was one issue. Right. And then they did a second issue, and that one was suddenly in color. 
Uh, I'm not sure why. That sort of defeated the whole idea of it. I mean, you know, you asked earlier about whether it was just because they thought Warren was yeah. having success. You know, Jim said, well, that maybe, but they also had this black and white, yeah. you know, printer that they needed to, to keep busy and whatever. Okay. But uh, my understanding, and I'm I am I'm the worst insider in the in the history of the business, <laughs> but I was always told, and I don't remember by whom. I'm not trying to protect the innocent here, but or the guilty, but um, that Warren made the majority of his money on the ads. Right. Because Warren had okay these Warren you know creepy creepy eerie, eerie and Vampirella. And then they did a, a, a war book also briefly. Bad, uh, Blazing Combat. Blazing Combat. Um, Frazetta. And they would be... Yeah. Oh, yeah, Frazetta did good the cover. Uh, really so, good So stuff. beautiful. Yeah, and, nice and, they, and he also used some of the all-time greatest uh, comic book artists. Wally Wood was one of them, Absolutely. I think. And uh, Gene Colan worked for him. Uh, Al Williamson, Angelo Torres, Steve Ditko. Al Keller. Uh, hmm? Okay, Alcala, sure. Yeah. I didn't. Fredo Alcala, yeah. Uh, um, wait Mo a minute. Noodleman. Who's it? Wait, who? Mo Noodleman. Never mind. I that. just. <laughs> that's a made up name. I just read. Uh, Reed Bill, Crandall. Reed Crandall, of course. You're brilliant artist. Ooh. There's an amazing, if you guys are interested, and in I would imagine you are, given that you're interested in Marvel black and whites, you might also be interested in Warren black and whites. Incredible biography of Jim Warren just came out in May. Oh, yeah. Bill Shelley wrote it. It's fantastic. Who it's you, is that uh, Tomorrow's? Did they publish it by any uh, chance? I think Fanagraphics. Oh, I'm pretty sure Fanagraphics, okay. but man, it is so good. And I mean, you know, he did the Kurtzman biography a couple of years ago, and so, Otto Bender. He's a great. Bill, yeah. Bill knows what he's doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's a good historian. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but uh, my understanding was that uh, Jim Warren, who was a canny businessman, he was one of the first guys to turn us down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sitting there. I'm watching Jim going like, <laughs> I'm going to kill him. I said, Don't kill him, Jim. We may work for him eventually. Yeah. And uh, I did. <laughs> there you go. Um, but his mail order business really was yeah, the problem. Yeah, and I get I, what I heard was he would go to these different companies who had materials that they sold that he felt related to the horror magazines. Like they had Frankenstein and Weirwolf, you know, Wolfman masks, yep. and all kinds of toys and games and gizmos and things that were monster related. Yep. And he would say, hey, listen, I can give you. National advertising in my extremely popular magazines, <laughs> and for no charge, but give me product in exchange. So he would, you know, he would print ads, and they would give him, okay, here, take a hundred Frankenstein masks or whatever. I don't know what the details were, but then everything that he advertised—that was his idea of promoting it in his magazines was that he was selling the, the stuff that they were making these companies and so he was getting all the profits. He would get the free mask, excuse me, and sell them in the ads that he, you know, had in his own magazines for free to himself. And they would, you know, so it was the Captain Company, was that what it was Something called? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And there were like pages and pages and pages in every issue advertising tons and tons of crap that he would sell that he got for free that then he, then he made a profit on. So I don't even know that those books sold incredibly well. I, they were very well done. They were, you know, I mean, it sounds like uh, they were just there to, to sell, sell, the, product. sell the toys. But really, uh, he had very good writers. Archie Goodwin wrote a ton of stuff oh, for yeah. him. And again, he had a plethora of brilliant, brilliant comic book artists from, you know, from the earliest days of comics on. Um, you know, so high quality work, and he made it work for him for many years, and then uh, I guess finally it, it stopped. It yeah, didn't, you know. well, about, about 1980, 81 or so, or 82, that's kind of when his stuff folded. Around the same time that Marvel started, stopped doing the black and whites, with the exception of Conan. Conan yeah. went on. Conan went on to the mid '90s, which really surprised me. But you know, I mean, it, well, I guess it shouldn't because Conan was always such a great uh, title for for Marvel. And right, so, made a fortune. Yeah, I mean, Paul. Other than other than uh, Deadly Hands, were there other black and whites that you worked on? Me. Yeah. Yeah, for Warren. Yeah. Oh no. Well, you, and, and, and yeah, I don't mind opening up to Warren as well. But the, I like to use actors. You know, as part of my uh, forte a little bit. Yeah. And I, the, I uh, cast. Uh, James Coburn as mm. the lead. Cool. <laughs> and he gets in trouble with this. Some guy was, 
experimenting with these toxins that got into the, into the ground and started affecting families and homes and business, you know. It was a, it was a crazy, wacky thing like that. That's cool. That, that sounds like... But right. I got a chance to get... He, had, he has a great taste of drugs. Mm. You know, oh, God, yeah. Great thrill. You know. so so my, my, nobody ever contacted you and said, no, don't, was, don't use our likeness? You know why I was running so late? It was too late to make the change here. Yeah, that was, that was my, <laughs> but I mean, but even animal, after, but, even but after, got people public. never like, yeah, never but, ca- James Colbert's people never said, "Hey, wait a minute." No, because you know, well, that's G- Jim has drawn um, uh, Mar- Marlene and Dietrich as a yeah. character in some of the books he did. I never did any likenesses. I'm no good at it, but um, I know. Well, remember, Gil, speaking of black and whites, Gil Kane did a magazine called His Name Is Savage. Yes, indeed. And it was more, <laughs> it was more violent. It wasn't more sexual. Uh, I don't recall it being, but I mean, I remember one panel where he's shoving a gun through a guy's teeth. Yep. You know, and I and I remember at the time going like, "Ouch!" You know, uh, and it was really nicely done. But the image on the cover was a painting of um, Lee Marvin, yeah, Marvin, yeah. the Absolutely. famous actor. Yes. And and the character on the inside was sort of modeled after him, but it wasn't. It was you more Gil Caney looking. It was a Gil Caney looking. It could have been anywhere. You know, anybody almost. But the cover, it was like clearly a, a painting of a Lee Marvin uh, face. <laughs> and I understand that he got a cease and desist letter from somebody. Yes, I somebody. understand it too, yeah. yeah. So that's that's why I asked whether anybody ever got any hassles for the lightness. And, and Paul, deadly, or a master of kung fu, had tons yeah. of cameos of, of celebrity likenesses, yeah. you know, which was fantastic. Yeah. So. Tell, tell the people some of the people that you uh, populate. Uh, Shang-Chi was based on Bruce. Well, of course. Bruce Lee. Of and course. Bruce, and uh, well, not a rumor. It was the fact that Linda Lee had contacted Stan about that. Oh, no. Knock it out. Wow. And, uh, wow. When it suit was not there, I, I just kept doing it. I told some other crew or whatever came on and couldn't grab that. Was it? Whatever, you know. Was it there? I, I ran into her. There was a, a oh. show about four or five years ago that came from L.A. up to Seattle, and that was uh, Linda Lee with all these artifacts with Bruce Lee, and all these, these Asians hmm. that uh, did artwork, and it was like a, wow. a three-story uh, museum. Yikes. And I told my wife, whatever we do, we gotta, I gotta meet this woman. Sure. And I came up to her, I says, my name is Paul, Go- I know who you are. And she <laughs> punched me in the arm. You know? <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> But not no, through your arm. No, man. There was but no I bet she could. No, I bet she could. Yeah, but that was pretty cool, man. Yeah. I was a huge uh, fan of Bruce Lee. Uh, yeah, absolutely. My God, absolutely. Well, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Well, and, and also, wasn't there a, a cab driver that was kind of uh, Groucho? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, Wait, and Groucho also, or Grouchy? Because a no, Groucho I, cab I, driver in New York's not that unusual. Yeah, that's, that's not typical. I that's not Marlene a Dietrich in one. Yep. Oh, you and, too? That and, was mine. She yeah, was she mine. was his character. <laughs> How and dare was, you? I'll sue. And, and wasn't, <laughs> and I forget his name, was it? <laughs> who was the secret agent? Who was the secret, I know, who was the secret agent that was kind of intimated to be, uh, he sure looked like uh, Sean Connery, but he was like kind of a son, he oh, could have been the son of James yeah, Bond. Clive Weston. Clive Weston, okay, I was going to say, I don't, like, I know it's not Clive Owen, but I knew it was Clive. All right, very cool. Yeah, yeah good stuff, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm sure people are going to wonder, and I'll let you people ask if you've got questions. You guys know what we're, now, we're talking about? Well, and also, I would imagine, uh, <laughs> you know, know, Paul might, might have some insight in what's going on with the Shang-Chi movie and everything, and I mean, just from a cursory... Well, and, they no? came to him first, then I'll, let me chime they, in. Yeah, well, I'd like to hear from both of you, actually, yeah, yeah whatever, you, whatever you guys are able to say. We just hope people get a kick out of it. Ha. Cool. Yeah. Ha. I just did a I just did a commission drawing for a guy. He wanted a, a a picture of Bucky, so I drew him throwing a sidekick, and I wrote sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> Do people have questions? I mean, I, honestly, we we can go on. Yes, please. How did they initially choose the the characters that get the black and white? Just the ones they got. Like, or was it that simple, or was there other? Yeah, that was basically it. I mean, Spider Man got his own book, but they weren't going to put the Fantastic Four in a grittier book, so... But the Hulk was, which is interesting. Yeah, I actually... Oh, that's what oh yeah, I you forgot about, about that one. Yeah. And you did you did Hulk stuff? Did oh, you, yeah. With Alex Nino. Oh, fantastic. Wow. And, and, and you did some painted covers. covers. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good Lord. No, that book... Yeah, one of my favorite jobs Submariner was, on one of the uh, covers, I think. Yeah, Submariner, uh, but Alex Nino came and worked over my layouts, and he was... 
one of, that was one of my favorite stories. He that must because he had this crazy berserk dropping acid uh, kind of style that was just uh, huh. worked just well. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. He was no, no, he's, he's, he's Filipino. Filipino. He's another Filipino, oh, Filipino artist. Okay, yeah. but his his style, uh, if you're not familiar with Alex Nino was mostly uh, Filipino guys were really good draftsmen. They drew really well. They rendered beautifully. His stuff was just off the wall crazy. He looked as different from them as, as they looked from, you know, Picasso. I mean, it was just... It was just the most bizarre, offbeat-looking stuff. Great-looking stuff. If you were an artist, you loved it. But it was real bizarre and real different. I remember talking to Alfredo Acala, who was another one of the Filipino artists, and he would shake his head when Alex and the Nino's name came up and he said, no matter how he tried, he could not get the likeness from one panel to the other. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> that was great stuff. How about man. the... Guys, what is it? Uh, uh, fool it... Foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Is that the quote? You know, yeah, something about, uh, something about consistent. <laughs> you know, it's like if the guy's doing brilliant work, does the character have to look exactly? You know, Jack Kirby never drew the same the character no. the same from panel to panel. Galactus has 150 different costumes that he changed between the panels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what were you going to say, Paul? I was just going to uh, chime back on in regards to Filipinos. Yeah, these guys would be working on uh, the board one day. The next day, a, a typhoon would come in and I the whole thing. Wow. You know about that? You heard no, that? I never heard yeah. that. Jeez. Yeah. What I love is the fact that um, they would draw to comic panel scale because I know the original uh, pages that you guys would draw on were first twice the size and then uh, size and a half size larger half, yeah. than what gets reduced to the comic page. But all the Filipino artists saw were the finished comic books, so they learned how to draw like these intricate pictures in these like little tiny panels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I don't think I knew that. Unbelievable! Yeah. Unbelievable! That's yeah. crazy. They also had a they had a they had different paper. They would work. Oh, did you ever see any of the Dzunaga stuff? It it had a texture on it, so he could do. You know, he could do the, the work, and then he could get these weird textures if he used a slightly drier brush, and you'd get a kind of a gray, uh, dry brush effect. I mean, it looked like, uh, I always said, it looks like he's drawing on, on a window shade. You know, is that, where are they getting their paper from, these guys? But it was, you know, it was fascinating. Uh, They're getting it from Manila. But Well, maybe, yeah. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke, bad joke. All right, sir. Anyway, help us, save me. How do you feel about the Shang-Chi movie coming out? And also, Jim, did you co-create Shang-Chi? Ooh, Coke what? Co-create. Did, did Jim, oh. Wow, how do you feel about the Shang-Chi movie? Yeah. And did Jim co-create Shang-Chi? Uh, yeah, Steve Englehart and I uh, created Shang-Chi. Um, and I helped. Yes. <laughs> um, I was out in San Diego when uh, Marvel decided to finally officially announce it. Uh, they've got a terrific... Uh, director who uh, has, has done one of my favorite movies called Glass Castle, which has nothing to do with anything he's going to do now. And the Last Castle? Glass. Uh, Glass Castle. Oh, Glass. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, I don't know uh, that one. They, they found the Shang-Chi already, and he did his audition for it on Tuesday, and Thursday announced that he told him he had the part, and Sunday they announced it at the convention. So... Uh, well, when I met him, most of the time he was sitting there with his mouth open, hanging open in surprise. Still, uh, but it looks like it's going to be have more of a comedic edge to it than the story that Ingvar and I uh, originally did, because it's a pretty grim story. You know, it's about a, a trained assassin who turns on his family, and uh, I think taking the, the little Marvel comedic edge that they've done so well and so many other things is probably a good idea in this particular one. And then and there's no thing to mention. Right, and replacing obviously because we heard it's you know the Ten Rings or whatever that obviously we all it's assume it's the Yeah, Mandarin. Yeah, Mandarin. Mandarin. yeah. So that's interesting. And I kinda like it. It's kind of an elegant replacement for Fu Manchu. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, they could have gotten a yellow claw. Well, and that, yeah, but that's another one that I think is problematic, even just by his name, unfortunately. I, and I always thought so, too. And it's like, yeah, but it's a great character. Change his name. Because, I, I mean, I always felt 
And forgive me, folks. Are there no bad Asians? Is that what well, we're saying here? But honestly, I always felt that there that, have to be bad people in all ethnicities. Let's but, be well, fair. And as and then really the the, okay, let's the, be fair. the sex. Uh, when I started working on Fu Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us. Uh, Standard Oil bought the rights to it to Fu Manchu. Right. We grafted on there. I never. Oh, I thought it. it was a separate thing. They bought it specifically to be in no, that book. They, they bought it and then they they grafted. They said, "Oh, here's where we can we use it." it. Yes. And I had never read one of these uh, Fu Manchu books. And as I finished the first issue, Larry Hama, who is Asian, came up to me and said, have you ever read any of these? And two days later, he brought me a book. And uh, after having read it, uh, it was a major factor on me only lasting on this book for about the three uh, issues. issues, because the Sax Romer books really are the most racist pieces yeah. of shit you've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, you know, 1930s, uh, everybody white is cool, everybody who's not white, don't turn your back on. Even earlier. I mean, yeah, I think, yeah. I think yeah. they it's go back to like the teens or the yeah. 20s. Is that a, but, well, but also, well, I will say this, uh, that I, I've read two or three of them. Mike Vosberg, who's a friend of ours and, a, and, a, and an artist also, um, he used to be a big fan of the books when he was a kid. Uh, but they they I always <laughs> well we hope but you know but they did I mean Fu Manchu was like the evil the evil mastermind but they always spoke of him always an evil genie you know, they said you know nice things about him except the fact that he used his powers for evil instead of good I mean he was like the most brilliant mind and he had developed a, an, a uh, immortality serum or something anti-aging and stuff like this so he had he was very accomplished and very brilliant but he was also a, a, an evil bastard you know and he he was certainly you know he wanted he wanted the east to rise up and, and uh, conquer the west sure. so you know. I, was, I always felt he was a, uh, an Asian Moriarty and I mean, yeah. in the most just super genius kind of sort yeah, of way. Yeah. But no, you're absolutely right. No, I did finally read the books, and they are really embarrassingly wrong. And yeah, it's, yeah. well, know, of their time. As much as, I mean, it is a time. A time yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember reading some of these uh, early James Bond books. Sure. And going back to and the things said in Jamaica and not being offended by those. Sure. sure. Absolutely. But, you know. Fortunately, he's not there. Man, yeah. Coming in. And, well, that's the thing. You don't want to. You don't want to get rid of Shang Chi because he is such a great character. And I mean, I think a great positive. Again, white middle aged white guy saying this, but I think a positive character. You know, I mean, you know, I hope I hope that the <laughs> audience receives him as as the positive character he's intended to be. I have a question. Uh, somebody recently told me or asked me if I knew that uh, the um, Kung Fu TV show which was one of the things that inspired Shang-Chi with you and, and Steve, uh, that initially they wanted Bruce Lee to pay, play the part. No, that's, you got the wrong movie. Yeah? Oh, I thought, well, somebody, yeah, I said actually, somebody said it's true. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Too. Well, and it's part of his film biography that he pitches the idea for Kung Fu, and they make it without him. And basically. they make it without him. Oh, okay, maybe that was it then. Wait, somebody knows that. Go ahead. Go for it. He pitched the show. Okay. Yeah. And then Hollywood pulled it from him. Right. Right. Hey, that's yeah. a great idea. Let's get a white guy to play you. Well, or half white guy. I guess right. wasn't he a half cast in that movie or something like that? In the TV. In show. the TV show, yeah. I met Kay Lou. But we used to get. Awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah, he was incredible. Yeah. He was such a good guy. No, he's a, oh, he was a long time an Hollywood amazing, actor. Amazing character actor. Absolutely, yeah. my God, what a career. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was a thrill but, for me as a uh, kid. But more <laughs> questions, folks. Sir. Um, what, what do you guys think really killed the black and white side, white from existing? Because they were aiming at a more mature market. So what, 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 do you think, what do you think made them die out from the I think it was shelf, shelf spaces. Shelf space? Yeah. Also the fact that the comics code was fading from the fact that uh, a lot of the stuff in the 80s and the 90s in the color books were becoming much more mature also. And I'm, I'm guessing, because this is usually the bottom line, was that it was the bottom line. Uh, probably they had a, a period of some success, and if they were still selling well or making a large profit, they would have kept them going. My guess is they were becoming less and less profitable, except for Conan. And so they said, well, we tried, it didn't work. I mean, Marvel was trying to expand the brand all the time. You know, they, they had pretty much captured the majority of the superhero market, and that's when they started doing not only the black and whites, but they came out with all the monster comics. They had 
all the major monsters, you know. <laughs> they had their version of Dracula, they had uh, Mobius, they had Frankenstein, they had the mummy, Where they had a couple of, of Will, Werewolf, Werewolf by Night, yes. and uh, 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 J. Jonah Jameson's son, the Man Wolf. Man Wolf, of course. Right, and uh, they brought back uh, It, the Living Colossus, and, and, you know, it was a giant thing that Kirby had drawn originally, I think, and... Uh, Wolfman Jack. Wolfman Jack. No, he was a DJ. <laughs> you can't fool me. Uh, I don't know. They, man they, Thing, of course. Sure. Man, yeah. Cool. Well, you know. Man Thing and Swamp Thing both came out like the same month, and that was and that was really just a rip off of the Heap, which was an old character from Hillman Comics in the '40s and '50s, and uh, Skywald revived that. I think it was probably public domain, so they just started doing. Uh, some heap comic books. Those were black and white. Skywalker yeah, had fact, some black and white comics and, too. And in fact, doing my research, I, I guess the feeling at Skywalk was that Marvel's black and whites kind of killed their line because they were doing these black and whites, you know, mm-hmm. around the same time. And then, well, yeah. they also didn't they also do the Ghost Rider, uh, the, the original fit Western uh, Ghost Rider. I think so. Maybe. Do you remember Jim? Reprinting well, that was- it. Marvel had the Ghost Rider. Yeah, they did the they did the original Ghost Rider, the cowboy character, and then the, the modern skull riding a motorcycle yeah, guy. And they did something similar over there. Oh, is that what it was? Also, oh, okay. You worked over there for one job or something. Skywalk? Right? No. No, no, okay. It was our, folks did. That was that was almost our first professional job. Where we we were taking samples around and after Orlando got done chuckling about the Filipinos being better than we were. Um, you know, we went to Marvel, and they said, yeah, you guys are good. Not yet, but you're good. You picked up a couple, like, two-pagers from Orlando for House of Mystery. Something like that. Filled in things. One, uh, I kept saying, oh, ooh, Jim, let me ink it. And he, he got uh, Dave Cockrum ink your first one, and then Wayne Howard inked your second one. I remember more about his uh, history than he does, I think. Um, but Skywald, Saul Brodsky, who was Marvel's production manager, left the company to try his hand at doing his own publishing house, which was Skywald. And Sky was from Brodsky, Sky, Ski. I don't know that. I don't know that. Oh, well, and the other, the Wald part of Skywald was Israel Waldman, who was a schlock publisher in New York. Ah. He, um, if you ever saw either Super Comics or IW Comics, yeah. Israel Wal- that was IW, it was Israel Waldman. He found a warehouse full of old printing plates or something like this, or film or something, uh, and he would, he would do reprints of old comic books, and he, uh, you know, I guess they were all in public domain, but he would uh, hire somebody to do a new cover. I know uh, Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito did some, uh, Irv Novick did some, um, Jack Abel did some, wow. and they reprinted. You know, I mean, it was cheap for him to produce it, and I guess he sold ads, and he found, made a profit, and he did a bunch, of, excuse me, a bunch of these things. Um, they created over the course of several years. They created Captain Blintz. Right? Who? No, Captain Blintz. <laughs> 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 I think I got that wrong. Paul's doing his own stand-up over here, and I'm not. I'm not following. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Paul a, a question because I Captain I, Blintz. Doug, Doug Munch did so many great Planet of the Apes stories. Did you ever work? Oh, with there's Doug a guy? black and white magazine. Yeah, man, and it's one we haven't mentioned yet. And I was wondering if you had done any work with him on uh, that stuff because that was incredible. Oh my God, the directions that he went in beyond adapting the films. And some of those great stories. I mean, I remember an ape story where it was like uh, a riverboat, like a Mark Twain kind of riverboat or a gambling thing where an ape was <laughs> kind of a riverboat gambler and stuff. I don't know if you... Yeah, no, I don't remember. I, 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 I never had time to read the books when I was I working because <laughs> I was so busy. We all were, I think. You know? We were in jail for a while. Who? Me? Again? Yeah, it was for creating Captain Blintz. They, they blocked me up. <laughs> I said, you can't, you can't somehow, you know, take over this... A nice dish. Weird Jewish with food. <laughs> yeah, the powder, powder sugar turned out to be cocaine, right? Were there other black and whites that you guys wish you had had a chance to work on, like the Dracula book or or, uh, or Planet I did of the a Apes? short Dracula story. Did you? Point, cool. Uh, Sid Shores ain't did. It was just a fill-in thing. Oh, really? Were those, that. were those their own continuity, or did they dovetail into Tomb of Dracula's ongoing story? Uh, mine was a World War II Nazi story. Okay. So out of no. continuity. Yeah, yeah all right. Yeah, I don't know. No. And, and Paul, did you ever do any other, uh, you know, or want to do any other of the uh, black and whites beyond Deadly Hands? You mean the bigger magazine? Yeah, yeah. For Marvel or 
Any, well, anyone, but I guess Marvel in particular. No, not particularly. Okay, and like yeah. you said, you did a little bit of Warren stuff. So. I don't think so. You know, Marvel's book couldn't even hold a candle to what, what Warren was doing. Interesting. Yeah, I did okay. my best stuff over on the Black and Whites, over on Dark Cloud and the Mystic, over at Erie. Yeah. Much better than just Conan stuff. Interesting. That's yeah. Stan trying to make a book. Yeah. I understand. Well, yeah, that. Well, and again, we were always trying to make a buck. Let's be honest. I mean, when I was up there, I like eating. Yes. <laughs> uh, we used to. Uh, the period when I was editing on staff at Marvel, we were doing a lot of uh, licensed material besides Conan. We were doing Godzilla and the Tran. Not uh, the Transformers came later, but the Shogun Warriors. Thank you, and the Micronauts. And GI Joe and Battlestar Galactica and uh, we had Tarzan for a while and Star Trek for a while, you know. But and I remember we got uh, oh Rom Space Knight. Sure. Yeah, GI Joe. Huh? Yeah, GI Joe. Yeah, GI Joe. Yeah, Joe. Marvel did. I didn't. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, Hama was writing it. And I don't know yeah. who was editing it, but you had the Micronauts. I had the Micronauts. <laughs> Bill Mantlo uh, uh, was a you know writer at Marvel at the time, and his daughter loved these little uh, Mego Micronaut toys, and so he said, yeah, these are really cool characters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if Marvel wants to do a comic adaptation, and he brought them up. He said, look, my daughter loves these. I think it would be a great thing for us to license, and somehow he, they made it happen. I don't know where that came from. Uh, the weird, unique thing about that, one sec, um, is that there were a bunch of these toys that we used in the book, but also Bill created several brand new characters, and they were all part of this Micronauts team, and they were little tiny micro-sized characters. And so I don't, I don't know if they're even, if it's ever been reprinted because half of it's owned by Marvel and half of it's owned by Mego, and so, and they can't agree to make money together on it somehow, so they never reprint it. And, and the first dozen issues, of course, were penciled by Michael Golden, who, right. you know, right. Yeah, yeah, he's a great, um, great artist. So, boy, this, really, excuse me, Jim, this guy had it. Sure. Before, I remember the Godzilla and the Micronauts and whatnot. Yeah. Who was before Star Wars? I don't remember doing whatnot. Who was before who? Star Wars? Who was what? Before? Star Wars. Who was before Star Wars? What was you talk about Godzilla as a character, you talk about yeah. all these trademark characters. Yes. I remember seeing Star Wars. Star Wars the first time. Yeah, well, Star Wars, Star Wars, uh, uh, George Lucas came to Marvel and said, hey, listen, I'm doing this new movie about a new, you know, bunch of characters, and I, he was a Marvel fan. He said, I'd like you to do an adaptation of the movie. And they said, uh, well, maybe, you know. I mean, because, you know, it had, no, it had no rep. It wasn't sure. the, the phenomenon it became. It was an unknown quantity. And they flew uh, Chaikin and who? Roy uh, Thomas. Was it Roy? Who Roy, Roy. Archie. I thought it was Archie. Oh, okay. I'm sure yeah. I knew they Roy flew Roy. him out to California. They let him watch a um, unfinished rough cut. rough cut, thank you, of the, of the movie. Like, like the, the floater, you know, cars that they drove in were, you know, you could still see the wheels and, you know, stuff where they, <laughs> they, they, you know, airbrushed they airbrushed out later and stuff. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know, this could be fun. And, and so they did it. And it came out, and you know, I don't think it sold terribly well. But then, I think after the second issue came out, the movie was released. I remember the book before the movie. Sure. Yes, because yeah. yeah, it was really. And then when the movie was such a huge success that they went back to press and, and sold over a million copies of the first issue when when they brought it back. So, you know, you never know. Wow, a million. Yeah. Yeah, you never, you, you know, you never know when you're going to catch lightning in a bottle like that. And but we used to. The reason I started saying this is fans used to write in, complaining, "Oh, you're selling out, and we only want to see your Marvel characters. We don't, we don't like all these, Tines. you know." And and you know, it's like you're. Well, yeah, we were selling out because we thought, okay, we can still do all our Marvel characters, but there's these are other characters that have, you know, followers, and they're successful in their own way, and and we can. Why not do those two? It's a publishing house. They, if they can make money by publishing comics, they're gonna, they're gonna do it. And now, you know, in this present era, um, you, uh, people come up. They, they just adore these old comics. I mean, and they're, and they're new versions of Rom and new yes. versions of the uh, 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 GI Joe. Okay. Are they doing a new? I don't know. If they do a I know they were gonna do a Micronauts, but they've got, you know. They're doing all of them now, and they're and they're considered, you know, oh, I, didn't you love those comics? So, 
you know, as long as you did a nice job with them, I mean, uh, both ROM and uh, uh, Micronauts had pretty good long runs, 70 or 80 issues, I think. And, yeah. uh, you know, that was respectable. Oh, yeah. You know, so... Uh, and G.I. Joe ran a lot longer than that at Marvel. It was a cartoon, right? What's that? Rob? Yeah. No, it was a no, toy. it was a toy, yeah. It was a toy. It was by toy. Yabig. The guy, the creator, came to the office. Yeah. He said, look, here's this great space knight, and it was really big, you know, for a toy. And it had a ROM, which is a read-only memory chip. And so it could make six different noises. Woohoo, you know. And it would go like, you know, and, and they were all, I mean, it, he didn't talk. It was all... You know, uh, jets, you know, like his, his jets on his back, or the ray gun firing, or me, 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 you know, like a truck backing up. I mean, it was just, they were boring. It was, it was really a boring toy, I'll be honest with you. But Bill Mantlo, who was, you know, a, a real, you know, solid working pro, and he never, you know, he didn't look down his nose at these things. He, he went and did them, and he had fun with them, and he did a nice job, you know, and, and people ended up really liking a lot of them, so. But yeah, if they could make a buck publishing something, they, they were willing to take a chance on things. We should acknowledge one black and white magazine uh, creation that obviously had a much bigger career other than his, if he only had one story or more, I don't know. Star-Lord came from the Marvel black and yeah. white magazine. Yeah. yeah, and Rocket Raccoon. Oh, there you go. I didn't realize Rocket did. I yeah, knew, his I knew, first uh, appearance was in a, Bill Mantlo wrote it and, and Keith uh, Giffen drew it. Wow. And it was in some black and white. Maybe the same, was it the same? Uh, was he in the same story with Star-Lord? Anybody know? So. I don't you think you guys no. know it was more his origin either. story in, in the. Yeah, it's, 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 there you go. Nice. Sh- well done, Shana the she devil. Satana. That, yeah. Wait, Shana or she? Whatever you guys call it. Shana. No. Okay. No, not Satana. No, you said I thought he. I thought he said. No, Shana. Okay. And him. that's where Rocket first appeared. It could be Shana. <laughs> Shana, Shana. Potato, potato. Yeah. We're running out of time. Any other questions? Oh yeah. Right Mitch. Hey, Epic Illustrated came out years later. That was in color. How come heavy metal had such a long run? Was more successful than Epic? Was it just distribution or better, better artists, better talent? Uh, they also were buying uh, a lot of work from over in overseas. Overseas, <laughs> what they were, you know, the the Mobius. yeah, the Mobius and that. They were getting a very cheap rates, so they they didn't have a lot of overhead. Okay. And plus, they were linked up with the lampoon. Lampoon. Very successful. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that probably helped. You know, uh, they probably wrote on its coattails for sure. the, for better distribution. Yeah. 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 <coughs> it's a weird business. The the you know the publishing you know business is a tough business anyway. But the distribution. You know, Jim was saying getting on the back of the trucks. Uh, that Marvel's original distributor back, at, you know, in the 40s, they were a big publisher of comics, but they were, you know, on the verge of dying out. And they were, when they were doing all those monster magazines, Lee and Kirby and Ditko, uh, and and a, a sort of a few others. So they were doing, I don't know how many titles, uh, but they were being distributed by the distributor that DC Comics owned. So you can imagine. How, you know, yeah, sure, we'll let you. Uh, they limited the number of titles they could do to uh, maybe, was it eight a month? Or it was something? eight. It, it was eight. eight. Yeah. I don't know how I remembered that. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's your, you know, your main com- competition is through the, you know, the grace of God and their goodwill letting you put eight books on the, on the trucks every month. <clears throat> and when they started doing the superheroes again, Marvel, and, you know, Lee and Kirby. We're exploding with all that stuff. <coughs> and they said, gee, you know, we'd kind of like to do more titles. And, you know, all these characters where it's, a, you know, half Iron Man and half Captain America, right. we'd kind of like to give each of them their own books. And DC said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, and then they said, you know what, maybe it's about time to look for our own distributor, which they ultimately did. And that's when they started expanding you know, at a ridiculous pace, and and kicking DC's ass, by the way. Naturally, it got me my job, because they went from eight books to 20-some-odd each month, yeah. and they were quite literally, I think all of us sort of came into the same boat, where they were hiring anybody who could come across the state line and hold a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> and I just barely called them on, so I got work. <laughs> yeah, that's not even true, but, you know, but it's true. I mean, Marvel was using, like, everybody they could dig up from the golden age, you know, all of a sudden, Kirby, of course, had been around since the get-go. 
uh, but and and was a huge you know you could produce a huge amount of material it's so creative and so fast and really good you know a lot of there's a lot of fast guys in the business who are very mediocre but Kirby was great and fast um, but then uh, you know they they brought back Sid Shores yeah, and right. and Wally Wood who had been around since the late 40s early 50s and uh, you know Dick Ayers had been around forever and ever and he was you know he would ink Kirby stuff or he'd pencil his own stuff. Who else? Don Heck. Don yeah, Heck had been around since the favorite. early then, 50s. Um, Gene Cohen. Gene Cohen. Gene Cohen, uh, they, bought, they pulled him over from D.C. That's when And a German name, I can't remember. It started with a W. Werner Roth. Werner Roth. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, you're welcome. Wayne Boring. Who? Wayne Boring did some... Wayne Boring did Marvel stuff? I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, very, did, very little. He did Captain Marvel two issues just before I took it. Huh? That's right. Wow. Well, this is, I think that was probably Roy. Roy loved all these old Wayne, guys. Wayne Boring was an old Superman. Superman uh, artist. artist well, 1950s. Roy got uh, Mike Sikowski to do uh, like something once for Marvel. I think and Jim it, Mooney would go from Jim DC Mooney, to Marvel. Yeah, Jim Mooney mostly... Uh, yeah, he penciled anything for Marvel. You're right. Yeah. He'd been around since the very early 40s. Uh, doing stuff. The only one who never came over was Irv Novick, I don't think, and Jim Aparo, who was not as old. But so, Stan, so along with all these old guys, who some of them went, had been out of the business for a while, uh, you know, there was a whole generation of guys our age. We're old now, but we were young at one time, uh, and we were we were big fans, and we wanted to do comics. In the earlier days, comic book artists either were hoping to become illustrators or hoping to get a newspaper syndicated strip that was the promised land and they were doing this to make a buck you know while while they were waiting for their ship to come in and the same with the writers you know they, some of the writers were pulp magazine writers or just you know wannabe writers and you know, here's a way they could make some bucks while they were trying to you know probably do something better but a lot of us i think we said no no comics is it that's where i want to go uh, and but a lot of the people, even in our, that generation, we came in with, or, like uh, Walter Simonson, yeah. he was only going to do it for a few years and go on. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's uh, the first. He's still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, but but there were a bunch of us guys who got into the business, you know, virtually at the same time. Uh, before us, there was Bernie Wrightson, Jeff Jones, and who else? Uh, Neil Adams and oh, yeah, Neil, Neil, Neil and Archie Goodwin. Yeah, that was the that was literally the whole generation before because yeah. all these guys from the forties were still working. Yeah, there weren't a ton of guys, but you know there were some very good ones, obviously. But then, and right after they got in, Jim and I, we I mean we met in junior high school. We went to the same you know middle school and high school and stuff. Uh, we were dying to get in, and Paul, I don't know what your story was, but you got in around that same period. Yeah. Uh, Alan Weiss, uh, oh, Dan sure. Green. I know those guys were some of the guys working on the Burrow stuff the at 70 DC. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, uh, forgive me. I got to stop you because. Simon said, no, no, I'm still I know, talking. I know. I know. Well, well, many of you guys are really interested in this stuff. Uh, Howard Chaykin's got this book out oh, right now called Hey, hey Kids Comics. Hey Kids Comics. Which is a history of it's great. Uh, the 1940s comic book uh, creators. Including Simon Schuster and all that. They're all under pseudonyms. Yes, and Siegel Schuster. Siegel Schuster. Yeah. And uh, now uh, he's doing a second run, which is actually going to involve people of our generation. Oh, is that right? Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a Romana Clef where there's, you know, it's not us, but it's characters, people you would recognize, you know, with different names. Right. So, so it's thinly disguised. Absolutely. I'm a great deal of Much like Clark Kent, he's thinly disguised. Exactly. It's, yeah. uh, no, it's I haven't fantastic. read it yet, but I'm looking forward to I'm going to go to my local comic shop and actually buy them because I want to support them. Oh, the first one's real good. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, yeah. I'll bet. I'll guys, bet. Great. Howard's, yeah, Howard's super creative. <laughs> and then you can talk to Howard. And please talk to these guys as well and then continue this discussion with them at their tables today. I, I'm sorry, guys. I but don't Bar hold up the line. Bar Barbara Freelander is waiting to talk romance comics with me. So thanks again for coming out. And thank you for listening today, guys. All right. Thanks. Sorry we didn't know anything about the Black and White magazines. So it started as an intended conversation about Marvel's black and white period of the 70s. We got a little bit of it in there. But uh, we also talked about uh, just their days in the Bronze Age of Marvel. A great conversation about uh, various creators. I didn't know that Starlin started off doing breakdowns of Spider-Man to help John Buscemi with his uh, deadlines. That's fascinating. I didn't, you know, I mean, great stuff, man. I'm telling you, just little tidbits like that. Al Milgram uh, picked up the microphone 
in mid-conversation, you might have heard that sound drop up for a second because he was looking at my digital recorder. And it's like, what is this? This is very curious. And it was like a four-year-old picking up like a toy that or something shiny. You didn't know what it was. I'm like, what are you doing? I wrote it on a notepad. I'm like, I'm recording this for my podcast. What the hell are you doing, Al? It was fine. He was awesome. They were funny as hell. And uh, man, I'm telling you, I enjoyed that conversation. And then they give Howard Jacobson, uh, Jacob a nice plug for Hey Kids Comics Volume 2. Uh, Howard was there. And uh, I believe us, we're uh, we're certainly going to have a new conversation about that coming up. We we talked behind the scenes at Terrificon, not on mic, um, but Howard did his own panel, so uh, he didn't need me to help him out with that. And I would rather be selfish and have him for an hour or more if he's willing to give it to me when uh, when we talk on our next discussion, which will be in anticipation of issue one of Hey Kids Comics Volume Two. And I'm I'm excited to uh, see the new volume. Uh, if anyone can tell the history of comics. Uh, both firsthand and uh, secondhand, as he got it as a young man from the uh, old timers he knew, uh, it's Howard. I think it's a great series from Image, and if you're not already aware of it, pick up that first trade and uh, join me in enjoying the uh, second uh, volume that starts in just a few weeks. But uh, thanks a lot for listening. A great conversation with uh, Paul Galacy and Jim Starlin and Al Milgram, and uh, good questions as well from the audience. A lot of fun, and I hope you enjoyed it today on Word Balloon. Brought to you by the Leak of Word Balloon listeners. If you want to support Word Balloon via Patreon and subscribe, is Word Balloon worth a comic, uh, you know, the price of a comic a month to you, a dollar a month? If you can spare it, I certainly appreciate uh, the sponsorship. Uh, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash wordballoon or wordballoon.com. Click on that Patreon ad right in front, and it'll bring you to my page at Patreon. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They're having a hell of a year, 2019, the year of reading dangerously. They are backing it up with excellent books. Uh, In fact, our companion episode today is a great conversation with Donnie Cates about baby teeth. And uh, that is one of Aftershock's great books. We also talk about his Marvel work. But uh, hey, baby teeth right up there with Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and the Brothers Track Cool and A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Animosity from Marguerite Bennett. Uh, wonderful stuff from Juan Doe, both as a writer and an artist. And also uh, my buddy uh, Tim Seeley, Dark Red. My buddy Phil Hester with Stronghold. Some of these great books, man. Lots more conversations coming up in the weeks ahead with Aftershock creators about their books. But you don't have to wait. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening. Another great episode, as I said, is dropping today. Donny Cates talking about baby teeth and his Marvel work and uh, God's Country and other great image books that he's doing, Redneck. Uh, a great conversation with Donny Keats to share with you on today's Word Balloon podcast, uh, along with today's episode that you just listened to. So check your feed. It's right there waiting for you. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.